Welcome to part two of the developmental theories and models for pediatrics. In part one, we learned about Piaget, Vygotsky, Maslow, behavioral theory, and cognitive social learning theory. In this video, we will be reviewing dynamic systems theory, introduce motor learning, NDT, sensory integration, and review PEO and how it's similar to some of these approaches. Don't forget, we have a podcast. You can listen to the pod quiz episode with the same name to test your knowledge after watching this video. I'll post the link below. Let's get functional. Dynamic system theory, also called systems theory, helps explain motor control. It is believed that movement organization is derived from the study of chaotic systems. Movement patterns that accomplish a goal come from a combination of multiple subsystems. A common example used for system theory is cerebral palsy, as it often presents with motor dysfunction. One thing that is notable about systems theory is that it is non-hierarchical, unlike Maslow's hierarchy of needs, for example. With systems theory, learning occurs not just in the brain, but instead the body and its environment as well. They all have an influence on each other. An example of this influence on each other is the interaction between sensory perception and motor movement. An infant's perceptions can guide their movements and vice versa. Even when you consider motor function by itself, it can further be composed of multiple systems such as muscles and joints and so on. Under this theory, all the subsystems spontaneously self-organize or come together and interact in a specific way to produce the most efficient movement solution for each specific task such as combing your hair. As it is non-hierarchical, no one subsystem is more important in the process to achieve the same goal. Different goals may use the same synergy pattern with new learning as well, such as with combing your hair and putting on a hat. The child through repeated practice selects a functional pattern that meets their environmental demand to learn and do the task the next time. So therefore, learning occurs when a task is functional and has a goal or outcome. Very OT. Learning occurs with the therapist when the child is ready to shift their behavior and the factors that drive such learning are identified. In terms of the child, systems theory looks at the child's inherent and emerging skills, the task, activity, and the environment the child is performing the activity in. One example is eating because the child uses a predictable pattern every time for movement such as bringing food to their mouth. As system theory can look at the child, the task or environment, it actually has many similarities with another theory you already know, such as PEO. In fact, like systems and PEO, most OT practice models explain the interaction between the person, environment, and occupation. PEO is much easier to wrap your head around than, say, systems theory, but you can see how they are actually quite similar. As we touch on how systems can be used to explain motor movement, let's talk about the motor learning model. The motor learning model focuses on having the child achieve a goal-directed action. Similar to PEO, motor learning aims for motor development from the child with their interaction in the environment for a task. So for a child to learn a new functional task, the child uses a general movement pattern in their environment for a goal. Through repetition of the task, the child refines their motor function to achieve the same goal more successfully. Motor learning calls these things movement synergies and our child's way of solving a task efficiently. One way to understand motor learning is by breaking down its important concepts. Therapists should practice with experiences that promote fast learning and skill retention by using the entire task in the child's natural environment. Learning should be implicit and not made to bring attention to the task. Repetition is essential, such as through mass practice, also known as a drill, or random practice, which means in no particular order. Random practice is considered better for learning. Practice should be allowed to be distributed over rest periods compared to mass practice. The child should receive feedback from the therapist about performance. Last point, practice should be done in a variety of environments to allow transfer of learning. So how does an OT use systems to promote learning? First, take for example, handwriting. They need to understand and be able to analyze movement synergies for a specific goal. They may give verbal instructions or demonstrate. Physical or manual guidance may also be helpful, but it should be removed as soon as possible so as not to interfere with their improvement in handwriting on their own. The child should be allowed to practice the entire task, such as in the classroom, as well as at home. They may do handwriting drills as well at first, but it's important that they practice randomly and over time with rest periods spread out. 
Throughout the process, they should continue to receive feedback to correct any maladaptive patterns. Then, as the child can perform handwriting in different environments, such as at home for homework, the child is considered independent in acquiring, transferring, and generalizing the skill. Let's move on to NDT. It has some similarities to motor learning as well. Historically, one of the key words to keep in mind with NDT is normal, as in normal postural reactions for movement. These movements and postural reactions are thought to be automatic. Another term you'll hear that is related to NDT is handling, or therapeutic handling, which is the therapist's guidance of the child in a specific way at specific locations on their body and how they handle them in therapy. I explain NDT at this point because its principles have shifted historically from the normal and automatic premise to now the combination of new principles of motor learning and dynamic system theories. NDT has also shifted to recognize how the environment is important. That's great for the client because of the many considerations of all of these factors and their assumptions. Remember how many OT theories factor in what PEO does? So therefore, with modern NDT, the OT would use handling to promote movement patterns that achieve the most efficient performance, but also consider the child's context, such as their age for the task in their environment. So as there has been a shift or split from the traditional NDT, recent inclusion of principles such as motor learning and system theory into it may also have questioned its efficacy. Still, NDT remains to be widely used, such as in conditions such as cerebral palsy. Last, we have sensory integration. This theory seeks to explain learning difficulties that come from organizing information of the senses, hence the name sensory integration. Sensory integration is associated with the SIPT, or Sensory Integration and Practice Test. The SIP looks at several subtypes of sensory interaction problems that include visual and tactile perception, vestibular and proprioception, bilateral functions, meaning both sides of your body, attention and tactile, or touch and defensiveness, and lastly, visual and touch discrimination. Another useful concept from sensory integration that is very OT helps us to understand and explain sensory processing disorders, which are over or under sensitivities to our environment. This can be for visual, auditory, tactile, vestibular, proprioceptive, taste, smell, and posture. Why is this important to consider? Oftentimes, children with developmental disorders often present with these sensory processing disorders. What are the best ways for an OT to provide intervention based on sensory integration? They should provide opportunities to experience their senses. They should provide the just right challenge. The child should be active in choosing the activity for the therapy session. The environment should be modified to support engagement for the child's optimal arousal level and comfort. To intrinsically motivate the child, they should be able to choose the activity and the activity should be play-based. The activity should also be modified as necessary to promote success. Overall, physical safety is the most important. And that's it for theories. You did it. Now to test your knowledge, check out the Pod Quiz podcast episode link below. I hope this video was helpful in helping you review the similarities and some differences between the theories, as well as learning the important concepts and how to provide effective interventions from each theory's perspective.